Ray Dalio is one of the largest investors in the world. He founded the Bridgewater Company, which is the largest bond fund in the world. So when Ray Dalio gets passionate about a subject, it's worth taking a look. In recent years, Ray Dalio has been working intensely on the growth and fall of empires throughout history. Today, I am summarizing Ray Dalio's vision of China based on the first published chapters of his next book, The Changing World Order, Why Nations Succeed or Fail. Let's go. I often talk about China on this channel because I am convinced that Asia is the area of the world that will be the most active over the decade. My information on Asia comes mainly from GovCall, a fund management and economic research company based in Hong Kong, because they are competent people whom I know personally. By the way, Ray Dalio also knows them, since the famous all-weather portfolio is based on GovCall quadrants that Charles Gov published in the early 70s. Here is Charles's growth and inflation matrix, and here is Ray Dalio's all-weather portfolio matrix based on inflation and growth. So what does Ray Dalio say about China? First of all, he explains that we must look at the evolution of empires over the very long term. The phases of the rise and fall of empires are spread over centuries. If you really want to see the rise and fall phases, you have to go back a long way. Ray Dalio's work has been carried out over the last 15 centuries. Of course, most empires are not 15 centuries old. Only China, India, or Japan can claim such a long existence. Let's take a detailed look at what it means for China, the oldest empire in the world today. An important thing to know in order to understand these graphs is the relative power compared to other empires. This curve measures relative deviation from the world, not absolute growth like GDP can be. In short, many empires disappear after one or two cycles. Each cycle lasts an average of about five centuries with the following phrases. A phase of growth during which the empire experiences prosperity that generates a debt bubble. The end of this period of growth ends with the explosion of wealth inequalities within the empire. Then comes the phase of regression, which takes place in successive stages. As the credit bubble becomes unsustainable, the empire corrupts the currency to give the illusion that everything is under control, which generates very strong social tensions as Mr. and Mrs. Everybody realize that they are getting poorer and poorer. Finally, these tensions and imbalances end in a political and economic refoundation. This can be in the form of a revolution, that is, a change of regime, or by any other means to overthrow the established order. Finally, a new order settles in, and the empire, if it has survived, starts anew on a cycle of prosperity. These long cycles spanning centuries are punctuated by small cycles on the scale of a few decades. Well, now that you've understood the basic reasoning, let's look at where current empires are in their cycles. The European empires entered a long cycle of regression in favor of the USA during the 20th century, and even the 19th century for the Dutch Empire, for example. As for the USA, it experienced its first phase of prosperity following its creation from the 18th century to the present day. It is therefore logical to see the United States begin a phase of regression, particularly in relation to China, which, for its part, experienced nearly 200 years of misery during the 19th and 20th century. What I find quite relevant in this analysis is that it fits very well with the financial observations that can be made about debt and interest rates. The US has a colossal debt with interest rates at 0%, which means that there is no long-term growth while China has largely positive interest rates and a controlled public debt with good growth prospects. Moreover, when we see Chinese growth slowing down, as we are gradually moving from an average growth of over 10% over the last 20 years to growth between 5 and 10%, we can clearly see this phenomenon of rationalization of this upward thrust that China has been experiencing since the 1980s. We find this observation on the graphs of Ray Dalio. China is in the middle of an expansion phase, and this phase is set to last another 10 or 20 years before reaching maturity. So how does Ray Dalio see China, knowing that it remains an authoritarian country very far from our democratic model? I often hear it being said that the autocratic nature of the Chinese regime is the one main obstacle to a sustainable rise. On this point, the founder of Bridgewater tells us to be wary. We should not try to understand China by applying our Western logic to it. According to him, China has three very different characteristics compared to us. China is not structured around a religion as Christianity can be. 
but around Confucianism, which is closer to a philosophy as Sufism was among the Arabs. In one sentence, Christianity puts individuals' responsibility at the heart of the social organization, while Confucianism puts group harmony at the heart of society. In other words, Christ has always told us to behave well without ever telling us what to do precisely. It is up to each Christian to seek the best way to be a good Christian. Christ gives only principles and no practical rules. In Confucianism, things are different. Chinese society explains to each of its members that they must occupy their place in society with dignity. Respect for peers and benevolence towards the socially inferior are required. Let's summarize these differences in two expressions. In the West, society tells you, go beyond yourself, push your limits and do your best. In China, society tells you, the nail that protrudes calls for the hammer. In the West, we value risk-taking and despise those who live off others, while in China, it is honor that is respectable and shame that is despicable. Confucianism endangers what Dalio calls legalism. To survive, Chinese society tells you to be one with the group. If you hold your place with dignity, then the group will take care of you. In the West, we tend to think of this kind of regime as fascist, because each individual does not have the freedom of self-determination. In China, you can be told that following the group is the only way for everyone to survive. Keep this in mind because it clarifies many differences of views between the West and Asia. Finally, Taoism is the third cultural factor that will make all the difference between the West and China. In the West, we place what is right above what is wrong. We seek, above all, to avoid suffering for the benefit of well-being. In China, this Taoist consciousness integrates good and evil as two sides of the same coin. This leads to accepting much more easily at the group level and evil for a good. It is the open door to all the utilitarian reasoning that allows us to justify the misfortune of some in order to safeguard the greatest number. Put another way, a hero in the USA saves everyone at the end of the film and never gives up on saving the last man, even if it may jeopardize the survival of thousands of others. In Chinese films, we quickly realize that there are many more people sacrificed, in line with the saying, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. In the COVID crisis, we understand much better the reaction of the Chinese or Japanese authorities, who were much harsher on the restrictions of individual liberties than it was the case in Western societies. Therefore, Judging the Chinese model with our Western eyes is a precarious exercise because it is a continental country that does not function at all like us, culturally speaking. Even on the expansionist level, while virtually all Western empires have sought to expand militarily beyond their borders, this is generally not the case with China, since it is a continental country in its own right. Most of the major conflicts that have traversed in this country have taken place within the country, which is so vast. It is also a question of culture since China has always established relations with neighboring powers according to its principles. On that note, I'll see you soon for new videos. Ciao! Thank you so much for watching. If you like my videos, please subscribe and don't forget to hit the bell if you want to be notified of the next episode. And if you want to invest in the stock market over the long term or diversify your financial portfolio, I'm offering you an analysis of the 8 European star stocks to have. Thanks again for watching and have a great day.